Good morning. It's about 8.45 on Wednesday, June 15th. And we're going to try and do a Wujo here while I'm in the noisy truck, which is why I've got the um, uh, microphone clipped to me, and we'll hope that that works. I'm just now getting onto the freeway here in uh, Olympia, where 101 joins I-5, so that I can head on up to Tacoma, to the Tide Flats, to where the um, at Citadel Marine, where the um, trimaran is because they're putting the gel coat on it today and I've got to go and approve the um, uh, the gel coat, the location of the um, bottom paint and the designated water line and that sort of thing. Also got to try and see if I can't get them to take the um, rest of the motor out for me. All that's left is the old block. Got to get it out before the new motor can be put in because we've got to move the thing at the end of the month because the Citadel Marine is shutting down their storage yard for sure. Maybe they're also going to shut down their, uh, close up their uh, yacht uh, repair and uh, building uh, shop. I just don't know about that. But, but my boat's got to be in the water by the end of the month. So we've got to get this stuff done. Anyway, so I've got to head up to Tacoma. I'm also going to go and pick up a giant aluminum I-beam and a uh, bunch of uh, aluminum quarter-inch um, square tubing for some uh, TIG welding I've got to do for the trimaran for the, um, as holders actually around the door and stuff uh, for the uh, acrylic uh, lenses, the windows, the ports, that kind of thing. Okay, here we go. On I-5, moving over into the fast lane. Kicked into sixth gear now, and off we go. Okay, so the point of this uh, Wujo was to discuss a number of elements here that have been showing up, um, occurring and uh, manifesting in reality, emerging from the uh, future into the present, and we're seeing them uh, pop up as forecast. Uh, some of the more um, interesting ones here uh, have been related to the uh, Terra entity. Um, because recently, like uh, two days ago and then last night as well, we've had snow in the Pacific Northwest and it's snowing all up and down in the Cascades. Uh, the Cascade Range down into Oregon and all the way up into Washington here is receiving, uh, you know, a very unusual summer snowstorm. And we've had a, a situation of low um, snowpack in the winter because we've had weird winters here recently. And so our um, snowpack, which is basically our water for summer for both drinking and for electricity and watering the plants and all this kind of stuff, is dependent upon the uh, uh -oh, dependent upon the winter uh, snowpack levels, and as I say, they've been rather small. And so just interesting that here we are getting this uh, snow in, the, in summer. Now what's very concerning to me, and I don't have any reports of it yet, but I'm going to ask a friend of mine who's with the um, uh, wildlife department and uh, or actually I think he's it's called forest management or something down in Oregon he's a he's a tree guy an arborist uh, down in Oregon that'll be going up to the Cascades to the snow line here pretty quick and we're gonna have him get us some uh, samples of the snow with this uh, particular approach that will allow us to determine if there's any Nueve snow in there now Nueve snow is snow that has a very particular kind of a crystal structure and we know from um, uh, looking at uh, uh, evidence on the planet that when you get Nueve snow, regardless of what time of the year you might uh, have it show up, uh, it is a precursor to a glacier forming at that spot. And so um, I'm rather interested to see if we're going to get glaciers forming in the, uh, in the cascades here that will be trying to, you know, push us out into the ocean, that sort of thing. Okay. So uh, anyway, um, there's the snow, there's also been um, uh, what amount to um, winter storms here in uh, the Pacific Northwest throughout this last uh, 15 or so days, especially in western Washington. Um, we've been getting these, uh, they're really like October uh, cloud bursts, uh, sort of our lakes uh, uh, coming down out of the sky kind of a thing, where they just uh, let loose on us and huge amounts of rain a uh, very short period of time uh, like you were squeezing a, um, 
uh, the water out of a, a sponge or something. I mean, you just grab it, squish it, and it all comes out. And then for a couple of hours, you know, everything around here is flooded, and then it dries up pretty quick uh, until the next one shows up. So very, very unusual storms for us for this time of year. They, they sort of resemble our October storm, our winter storm period, uh, but not quite. So there, there's still an even a differential there. Uh, very interesting period, though. Uh, weather-wise here. Then also I wanted to talk about um, uh, Bitcoin and some of the stuff that's going on with it. Now, uh, I've got to explain uh, this idea of crossing the chasm uh, here because uh, uh, it's not necessarily well known anymore. It was well known in uh, my day and age because technology was just starting to penetrate organizations and there were theories about how uh, that might occur. And so um, uh, one of the theories was that there's a particular uh, mode of adoption of technology, and we can put Bitcoin into that category uh, as it passes in, as a technology passes into um, uh, various uh, organizations or social milieu. And the uh, method that actually worked out, the theory that actually uh, panned out in reality um, has this method where they describe the uh, approach of technology where you get the real curious people within the organization that are always interested in the new stuff. Uh, they're called the visionaries. And you get visionaries that want to adopt a technology, they like it, they think it's cool, and they'll chat it up. Now, for whatever reason, or, or for, for their own internal reasons, they are uh, keyed in to, to uh, pursue the new technology and so on and they do it quite independently of whether anybody else ever adopts it and so you'll see this as the pattern with all new technologies and all uh, human cohorts where we're able to isolate the cohort and track the technology as it moves through and there'll be the, uh, the visionaries and they're the first group they're extremely small relative to the overall size uh, of the general population that ultimately is going to be exposed to that technology. So visionaries might only uh, be like maybe uh, a 20th or a 30th or, or something like that of one small tenth of a percent. So we're talking a fraction of a tenth of a percent, just the very few people in the organization that are truly visionary. They have the vision to look out and see what's coming. And so these guys will adopt the technology and they'll uh, bring it in and they'll start using it. And when they use it, then there's this um, next group and, uh, that comes on in and they're a little bit more numerous. And they're the ones that don't necessarily have the vision, but they know a good thing when they see it, when it's slapped in front of them. And so they're called the early adopters. And they, there's all kinds of gradations in this, but we're just gonna stick with basically these, these uh, three biggies, the uh, visionaries, the early adopters, and then the mainstream. Now, the early adopters are thought to, to number maybe as much as uh, one to two percent of any given organization. Usually it's less than two percent. So, um, you know, it wouldn't be surprising to see it be over one percent to, you know, up to like 1.82 percent or something like that of any organization are likely to be the early adopters. And these are the people that will use the technology, or they'll try it, they'll use it as it suits their needs and performs. And they're very, um, uh, unlike the visionaries who will tweak and make this shit work, early adopters to a certain extent are not that way. Uh, what they'll do is they'll, um, uh, they'll use it as long as it performs and, uh, and proves its metal. But it's pretty much up to the visionaries to tweak the organization structure to allow that technology to succeed. The, the early adopters are more inclined to be using it to get their job done, to get that uh, competitive edge in their work, and to uh, push themselves forward uh, using the technology. Whereas, quite frankly, the um, visionaries, uh, they like the technology simply because they like the technology, just because there's something in them that responds to it, it resonates with them, and they think it's cool. And so, that, like I say, they'll, they'll work to make the stuff work. Whereas early adopters, it's like they'll adopt it, you know, if they see a good thing in front of their face, but if it doesn't pan out, they're on to the next, next item because they, they have a different uh, focus or agenda here. And that's their, their personal career agenda or 
that sort of thing. Uh oh, I'm getting a bit of a problem with my camera here. Let's see if I can't jam it up over there. Anyway, so um, as I was saying, the uh, early adopters are the next one to pick it up, and they might number as much as 2% totally of your entire organization or your social cohort that you're talking about. And then, as I say again, there's all kinds of finer gradations. Uh, but then there's this big gap between the early adopters and mainstream. Because mainstream guys, they can't be bothered. They're really wrapped up in their daily lives. Uh, they've got their own stuff going on. They're subsumed and, and their minds are occupied with their problems and um, everything they must do to uh, just maintain and keep, keep going day to day. And they are also, to a certain extent, like the early adopters in the sense that they, if they find something that works, they'll use it. But these guys, the mainstream, are pretty much reluctant to do so. They're not going to actively go on out and look for it. They will wait for the uh, peer pressure, if you will, to start pushing the technology through to them simply because of the time for the learning curve and they are loath to take that time out. Now, visionaries are constantly learning. They don't understand the idea of a learning curve because they never stop learning. Early adopters uh, are the, um, uh, they're open to learning, they're actively engaged in learning, they like learning, but they're very specific about it. They want that payoff. They don't want to learn just for the, uh, the sake of the knowledge unlike the visionaries. So uh, in the mainstream, they know they need to, they're reluctant to, they don't really want to, they wait until the last minute to actually get in there and do it. And then they'll go ahead and do it. And from that point on, that's just part of their, their um, life and they couldn't even conceive of not having that technology around. So, you know, everybody that, uh, I mean, we saw this with cell phones and everything. And now you couldn't pry the cell phone out of most of these uh, mainstream people's hands uh, with a crowbar. <laughs> you know, you'd have some real serious problems trying to get their phone away from them. So anyway, that's, that's the, the major progression of technology through any social co cohort you care to identify. So now if we talk about Bitcoin, and we, talk, we can look at the planet as our social cohort, and the visionaries have been adopting Bitcoin since it was first announced in 2009. Now I first en encountered the um, white paper in late 2009, early in 2010, and knew uh, because I'm a visionary that I was seeing some really cool stuff here, but I didn't have the time or the wherewithal or the emotional strength at that point to start coding on my own. And so I decided I would wait and see if other coders picked up the challenge, which they did, and here we are today with uh, Bitcoin all over and Bitcoin hovering around uh, $700 uh, US to the Bitcoin. Now, the price on the Bitcoin is currently reflecting, reflective of what I had called the crossing of the chasm. Now, it's not truly that, okay? Because the chasm is the space between the, the um, edge of the uh, early adopters and the mainstream. What I was sort of really talking about, though, because we're talking about the Chinese population, and it is so huge, uh, that I was saying that there's a chasm between the visionaries in China and the early adopters in China, and we're just now crossing that chasm between the 120th of of uh, one tenth of one percent early visionaries and that up maybe up to two percent of the population that actually um, are early adopters. So <clears throat> we're at a point now where maybe let's just say um, maybe five out of a million Chinese are aware of Bitcoin and do something with it. And we're now going to cross over to where we'll go from five out of a million to maybe 10, 12, 30, 40,000 out of a million. So we're going to get a significant uptick in the amount of the Chinese population that wants to purchase Bitcoin. And this is currently what's accounting for its very rapid price rise and for the, um, I guess you'd call it irregular or non-chartistic patterns in which it's behaving because it, it's, you know, leaving these big gaps and stuff. But it's um, in passing and crossing this chasm from the visionaries over to the early adopters, uh, we're going to see a very spectacular uh, reaction in the price of Bitcoin. And that's because there's so many fucking Chinese. Okay, it's simply supply and demand. It's raw supply and demand. Um, it's raw supply and demand that's going to lead to a lot of emotionalism. That emotionalism is going to lead to a mania. 
the mania is going to be within the bulk of the early adopters and is not even going to hit the mainstream for probably another five years. So it'll be five years out before the mainstream of China gets the mania to get Bitcoin. And then they won't be buying Bitcoins. They'll be buying uh, decibits if they're lucky or millibits. Um, you know, multiply uh, small fractions of, uh, or in, uh, infinitely small fractions of Bitcoin, simply because the Bitcoin uh, by that time should be so hugely expensive that very few people will have the money to actually acquire a whole coin. Uh, and that has to do actually with what we're encountering now, which is this first wave of the early adopters. So we're in very, very, very uh, early stage of this now. And the very uh, leading edge of the early adoptive uh, adopters section of the Chinese society is just now getting into Bitcoin and that's fueled its uh, 16, 18, 20 percent, whatever it was, rise in the uh, past couple of days. And we should see some of those occur again. Now our data sets don't show numerals very often for, uh, numerals just don't make it through the linguistic processing very much. And that's because the, um, uh, the nature of the internet uh, has so many uh, references to numbers we have a tendency to screen them out. Uh, because they're not meaningful in our work in general. <clears throat> we do have one numeral, though, that shows up. Uh, we actually have two relative to Bitcoin. We have the numeral where we get the idea that um, Bitcoin does not like being in the, in the 1,000s, okay? That's 1,000 up to 1999. And that's going to transit through uh, from $999 to a Bitcoin up to $2,000 to a Bitcoin in a fairly fast clip. <clears throat> now, that fairly fast clip is showing in our data sets as maybe being as rapid as it's passed through the 500s, which would be, you know, a, a small fraction of a month, uh, just a few days maybe. It'll go fairly rapidly once we get into this um, uh, next flush. And then we show a, uh, I guess the chartist guys would call it a consolidation or a pullback or a correction or something uh, that occurs about the time we get into um, the uh, $2,000 per Bitcoin range. And so, it, so it's going to solidify there for a while and hang around there. We know this simply because of the interaction uh, within the data sets between uh, Bitcoin and gold at that point. So gold takes off and uh, silver take off at that point in a, another serious move up. And uh, Bitcoin at that point is um, uh, goes into a little brief consolidation before heading towards our second numeral that shows up, which is 14,000. So apparently there's going to be a point where there's a lot of discussion uh, about $14,000 per Bitcoin uh, showing up on the exchanges. That appears, as I move model space, to it first starts showing up in, at the end of this year. At the end of um, uh, December this year, we start getting those uh, first data hits for that. Now, it may not mean that it, it may be that that uh, price does not actually show up for a number of months following the first of those uh, data points because we deal in things in a uh, scatter graph as opposed to a, a linear chart. And so it takes a while for the main uh, level of that data to actually appear. And that's what we're running into now is sort of the, the flow of the data. It's, it's not really possible for me at this point to predict when the 14,000 will show up, but I would suspect just based on the data flow that it's not going to be until early part of 2017, maybe mid-2017. Our, our long-term data sets are not that um, detailed nor that accurate that far out. So uh, we just, uh, uh, we know that's coming, we know it'll be sometime after the end of this year, and that's really about all we've got for uh, the 14,000 number. Now, uh, other aspects of the thing about Bitcoin, though, are very interesting, because we have a clear indication between Bitcoin and silver that once we were uh, over the 650 mark on Bitcoin and settled out on that, so to speak, not going to go back and retrieve it, uh, not going to go back and test it again, as I guess they call it, uh, then we're going to get um, uh, gold and silver really taking off. And silver especially. Silver is uh, indicated to be doing the lead here um, during this next uh, big uh, uh, price up move. It's going to lead gold and, and really take off. And uh, the way it's sort of described, uh, it and, and uh, Bitcoin are going to sort of slug it out to see who can go up the fastest. So it'll be sort of a race between the two of them. Uh, silver really propelling itself up as well as uh, Bitcoin. 
and under the circumstances there, the uh, uh, plotting the uh, the Bitcoin move allows us to say, okay, at this point when Bitcoin's doing this, we think silver at that point has started to do thus and so. So uh, the indications are that that this is going to occur in July. Now there's a curiousness here relative to Bitcoin that I have to bring up. And that's just this. There was Bitcoin was going along in the data sets. It, it had a particular flow. Everything looked good. Uh, it was moving towards a um, uh, the 650 mark as we moved model space. But that 650 mark was showing up sometime um, after the 11th of July, probably around the 15th, maybe into the 17th, something like that. That's when we first started seeing the 650 mark in Bitcoin as well as the big up move in silver and gold. That's, and that was based on our scatter graph. That's when we had a critical mass form of these uh, data elements show up. Uh, we just went through one of those storms, by the way. These, I just got the edge of it. It's really moving over uh, Fort Lewis McCord at the moment. And I just skirted the, uh, the edge of it here. Anyway, so uh, here we are um, looking at the data. And it shows that Bitcoin's going to move to 650 in July. And then out of the blue relative to the data, we get done with the uh, uh, June report. And I start doing the processing for the July report. And all of a sudden, there's a big um, shift in the data sets and all this Bitcoin stuff jumps forward almost uh, four weeks, five weeks. So, so it went from predicting 650 uh, for Bitcoin in July to predicting 650 in Bitcoin in the early part of June. And so it's like, whoa, and that's when I went ahead and put that on Twitter and said, you know, if the uh, uh, immediacy data, it was all in the immediacy data that this occurred. And I was saying that if the immediacy data was accurate, then we were gonna see a, um, uh, $78 price rise in the in the price of, uh, of Bitcoin over the course of a week or so by the 9th and it actually occurred by the 12th three-day error range on IM data the immediacy data has a, an error range that uh, starts at three days and can extend out to three weeks but on really rapid shit like that I was looking for a, a three-day error range if it was going to be an error and so uh, didn't see the error uh, stuff but it didn't show up but in fact waited after the 9th and then the 10th, 11th, and 12th, we saw our push past 650. So to be quite frank, I don't know what that means. We've had, we've had data sets like that jump before, but it is so rare that there's no um, uh, real understanding on my part as to what is occurring then, as to why uh, that's happened and what it means for the other sets. So it's kind of put the July report into a um, really interesting uh, position here right off the bat. Uh, because uh, we're assuming that a lot of the data sets have changed and we'll be looking at a new uh, landscape, a new temporal landscape, if you will, a timescape or futurescape that's approaching us that has different configurations. Because we've obviously passed 650 on, on um, uh, Bitcoin, and so unless it dropped down below that or bounced around on that for a whole long uh, month of time, then the 650 after the 11th of July uh, in the previous processing is not necessarily um, uh, accurate or live or uh, valid anymore. And so until I get to the end of the processing here, I just won't know. I can look at some of the, uh, I can sneak a peek at some of the stuff as it goes along by slicing out little bits of the data and putting in the model space. But in the, in the main, it's not all that meaningful because you lose so much that you lose context and so on. And so looking at it for uh, just to get a glimpse just to get a hint, that's okay, but to try and do any sort of an interpretation off of it, it's just a no, no starter. Uh, it just can't happen. Uh, simply because you're dealing with such small amounts of data. Uh, it's gonna get a little weird here for me and I'll probably end up stop, stopping talking here in a minute because I'm gonna have to do this uh, strange little uh, exit routine in the middle of the freeway in I-5 uh, to get down to um, uh, the, Tacoma, Tacoma, the, the Tacoma Tide Flats. Uh, in just a minute here as I get through our major um, uh, freeway problems. We have really stinky traffic around here, probably some of the worst in the world. I'm sure China has worse traffic than we do, but you'd really have to um, uh, uh, have some serious proof <laughs> to claim there's worse traffic in the U.S. than we have here along the I-5 corridor uh, from Portland to Seattle. It is just really yucky. 
Anyway though, uh, so nice day at the moment. We've got some uh, nice clouds coming through, no chemtrails, blue sky. Uh, about ready to move over into the city center uh, exit area here and of course it's all bollocked up as usual anyway so um, so I don't know what to say about the 650 the the Bitcoin rise with silver and sil in uh, and gold in uh, July but that's the way the data had laid this stuff out prior to this most recent processing and in this most recent processing it was indeed um, uh, very much a uh, situation of a shock to see this large set and all of its subsidiary uh, subsets move over there uh, that rapidly and that far uh, in our temporal um, landscape here. Uh, so, as I say, it's going to be a very interesting uh, summer. I'm going to shut down the video here in just a minute. Uh, concluding thoughts here before I go through all the madness of getting into the actual city traffic and um, uh, but uh, like I was saying here it's going to be quite the summer uh, not only on the Terra end which we may be having glaciers form up here in the Northwest uh, and um, but also in Bitcoin and also in um, uh, gold and silver and it may mean that the shift and I won't know for about eight more days when I can actually start really loading model space, right? Uh, fuck. No, no, I'm good. I'm good. Um, anyway, so um, uh, we won't know for about eight more days uh, as to uh, whether or not uh, we're going to get our... Uh, or uh, until I get at the data. I won't know for eight more days until I can load model space. Uh, sorry about that. It's getting a little uh, uh, tricky here, traffic-wise. So I'm going to uh, just shut this down now. It's really the only two things I wanted to talk about was the Terra Entity stuff, the potential for glaciers forming, our weird winter weather here, and uh, the Bitcoin silver correlation, and all of that. There's all kinds of other stuff going on, but this has been long enough, and I've got to... Um, Pay attention to my driving. I will edit this and post it later.